Welcome to Fisher Webinars. The following is a recording of Return of the Dragon, How China is Reshaping the Global Pulp and Paper Industry, originally recorded on Thursday, December 6, 2017. And uh, as, uh, as Kelly mentioned today, we're going to be talking about China and its impact on the global pulp and paper industry. Uh, but I think uh, there's a general theme that I hope uh, everybody on the call today takes away, which is that uh, the global pulp and paper market is, is now in a state where global trends and global economic trends have implications worldwide. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, it was true that Many, uh, many companies uh, in the pulp and paper industry could be successful by being regional or focusing uh, in their immediate area. And with consolidation now and the increase in importance of trade and, and certainly what we'll talk about, the emergence of China, that's probably no longer true anymore. It's probably no longer enough uh, that companies can just be aware of their immediate environment and be successful. For example, Let's talk about the impact of regulation on, on the other side of the world here in North America. So the chart you're seeing in front of us is from our friends at Trade Tree. It's uh, Northern Bleach Softwood uh, Craft Pulp Prices. It's indexed to 100, and, and we like these prices because they're actually they're from actual invoices, so, uh, so very reliable. Anyway, you can see most recently there's a turning point in global pulp prices. And the turning point coincided with uh, regulations, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail shortly, uh, that occurred in China. And you can see in July, uh, China announced that it would no longer accept certain waste papers. And as a consequence, we can see uh, because of this regulation, pulp prices shot up, uh, shot straight up, in fact, a 30% gain. Now, in this chart, what you're seeing is a, uh, a chart from Fisher Solve, which is uh, viability benchmarking index, which uh, many of our Fisher Solve users are familiar with. And so red is at risk, green is healthy. Uh, and what I've indicated here for North American coated free sheet mills is, is two particular mills, Appleton Code and West Lynn. Both of these mills were non-integrated, meaning they have to buy market pulp uh, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the market uh, to furnish their mill. And we can see subsequent to this chart, uh, which was in June 2017, that both Appleton Coded and West Lynn have now uh, filed for bankruptcy and have uh, gone out of business. So for some, some sectors of the industry, these implications, global implications, can have negative impacts. For others now, we'll see how they can be very positive uh, for your business. So this chart that I'm showing in front of you now is uh, an index of weekly stock prices for Fibria. Fibria is the largest pulp market pulp producer in the world. And Verso, uh, which is the largest North American coated free sheet producer. So let's start with Fibria in purple. You can see, uh, again, I've started this chart uh, in June 2017, a 50% increase in their stock price. In Verso, it's even uh, more dramatic. 150% increase in stock price. And so one of the big trends uh, worldwide that we'll focus on in this seminar, this webinar, is, is growth in China. Uh, and what, what many folks uh, may not understand yet is that China's growth, uh, as big as it is, has really just begun. And as it continues, China will increasingly uh, gain more leverage over the global industry. And what I mean by leverage is small percentage changes in the market or demand or supply in China can have wide-ranging consequences worldwide because they are so big. Okay, so just as a point here, uh, the slides that we're going to see uh, in the next 25 minutes or so come from a larger presentation, uh, which will be uh, available to Fisher Solve clients uh, in the upcoming year as part of our State of the Industry presentation. So uh, if that's something you're interested in, please do reach out to your representative. Okay, so we'll jump right into China now. Okay, so to level set for, for those on the call, uh, what I've got here is a chart of global pulp and paper capacity by country. We can see that China is about 26% uh, of the world's total and, and the largest uh, by eight percentage points over the next country, which is the U.S. And its growth is just beginning. 
on the next chart, uh, we've got these same countries uh, as a bubble chart. The x-axis is GDP per capita. So uh, that's, a, that's a, a measure of wealth. So how much wealth uh, uh, individuals have in a company in the, or in a country. And the y-axis is production per capita, per person. The size of the bubble is the total volume of pulp and paper production out of that country. And what we can see immediately, this is for tissue, uh, China is less than half of the tissue consumption um, of more developed countries, even though it's bubble, so its size of total production makes it already the world's largest tissue producer worldwide. And as uh, China continues to grow its wealth, it will also uh, grow its per per capita consumption of tissue, which will continue to drive it. And so, uh, Xiaomin, is there anything you'd want to add to that in terms of what some of those drivers will be as China grows? Mm, yes. Uh, other than the economic growth, uh, we think consumer behavior changing, such as more eating out and more business or tourism traveling and uh, as well as the establishment of better retainer networks here are the key drivers for tissue growth. Right, so we're going to hear the same story for container board, uh, which is another growing grade worldwide. So this is a similar chart, and as you can see, it's a very, it's a, it's a very, uh, the same picture really as we saw in tissue. Uh, China, despite already being the world's largest market for container board, uh, is still half the consumption of more developed countries and it's going to grow. And as it's going to grow, uh, China's going to need more tissue and packaging machines to feed that growth. And let's give you some numbers now to put that in perspective. So this is pretty straightforward arithmetic, really. Uh, we explored the tissue projections more uh, fully in a recent uh, PIC article that you can find on our website. But in this bar chart, we show projections of volume growth in tissue as China grows at various scenarios. One is if their consumption gets to the Japan level, the other is if it gets to the US level. The take home message really is, is if you do the math and China gets to a more developed world consumption of tissue, they're gonna need 2,000 plus tissue machines. If we do that same arithmetic on the container board side, you can see, uh, again, pretty staggering numbers, 200 plus container board machines. Now, to put that in context for you, in the North American market today, there's 134 liner board and medium machines. So what we're saying with this chart is as China grows and continues to grow as we expect, it's going to add more container board machines to feed that growth than exists in North America's market today. So how big might it get? We, we haven't talked at all about printing and writing grades, and that's because they've almost certainly peaked in China. It's a big market. 20 million short tons, but it really hasn't grown over the last four years. However, you're going to see continued growth in uh, the grades that are growing globally, tissue and packaging, uh, for which there aren't a lot of substitutes. And as, as Yao Min mentioned before, as the economy grows in China, so will its consumer class. Um, we're going to get a couple of bumps there. We're going to get you know folks with more discretionary income. They're going to use more buy more goods or have or eat out and that's going to drive increased uh, paper and tissue use and we can already see that uh, China which is 26 percent of the of the world's production today could easily be a third of global production uh, in less than 10 years and and again uh, another doubling if its consumption increases uh, to the rate of developed countries and like we said before, <clears throat> this is only, only going to increase the leverage China already has. I think uh, most folks uh, would acknowledge that, that China's influence on the market today is large, but just imagine if China doubles again in size, uh, the influence uh, it can have on the world markets. And certainly one area uh, which we'll explore in some detail today is uh, in, in recycled fiber furnish. So, these two charts I'm showing on my screen uh, compare China on the left to U.S. on the right, and what you're seeing is how those countries furnish their machines. Uh, and the two biggest uh, slices in both pie charts are uh, craft pulp and recycled fiber. You can see in the U.S. on the right side, we've, uh, about 70 million tons of capacity and about 37% mm -hmm. 
recycled fiber. China is almost double that, a little um, at 66% recycled fiber and a much larger market. So uh, again, this concept of leverage, um, small changes in China can have large consequences in fiber markets. And what's phenomenal about, about uh, this story is how quickly uh, China has grown. So what we see on this chart is uh, blue bars being China's paper production, which is on the left axis, and on the right axis, uh, the purple line shows the imports of RCP, or recycled paper, and we can see quite dramatically how uh, imports of recycled paper has grown from, from really a small amount, a couple million tons per year in 2000, uh, to 30 million tons um, or close to 30 million tons in the most recent year. You could probably also see on this chart that it appears the growth trajectory is, is somewhat uh, flattened a little bit. The curve has bent a little bit. Uh, and, um, and that, and Zhao Min, I, I'd like you to kind of provide the audience with a few uh, perspectives on why, why we believe that is. Okay, so as we all know that uh, the RCP pool available for recycles comes largely from two sources. One is the, uh, the own Western world's, uh, their own consumption of paper grades. And another one is the packaging, which China exports together with the products overseas. Since China is a large uh, major exporter for, uh, for the past 30 years, then you can see that uh, uh, after 2012, due to the uh, recent global recession, which uh, it just suppressed the demand from Western countries, so the exports has been flatted, quite flatted. And also, um, the rising labor cost here has contributed to the uh, less exports here too. The export growth is really flat here now. However, in the other hand, the domestic consumption grows faster. So more, it means more domestic OCC has been collected to fill the fiber requirements here. And also, since Western countries, uh, you know that they have been already slowed down in the total paper grid consumptions. For example, like printing writing papers, we have seen already seen declines there. So that's another reason the RCP pools is smaller, shrinking now. Thank you. Now, on the next chart, we're going to put the 30 million metric tons that we just uh, saw in context with global trade. So the, the first part of this chart I want you to look at, this map, is the shaded countries. So the shading in the countries it reflects the relative total furnished consumption. So you remember we, we saw before China uh, being the largest country and then the U.S., both uh, deep red here. So the largest recycled uh, furnished consumers by a country in the world are China and then and then the US what we've shown in the orange boxes is is trade so percent that that country imports as total recycled paper trade and what we've listed here are the five largest countries by trade and, and we pointed those in the orange boxes so uh, the, the take-home point here is China uh, is 51% of global trade in recycled paper and more than double the next four countries combined, which are Indonesia, India, Germany, and then the Netherlands. You'll note we haven't indicated a trade number here in the U.S., and that's because, as many of you know, the U.S. is actually a net, uh, net exporter of recycled paper. Uh, we've got, um, we produce it and then ship it to other parts of the world along with some other countries in Europe. Now, because China is so big in the uh, global uh, recycled fiber trade, uh, again, as we, we continue this theme of leverage on the global economy and the global pulp and paper dynamic, actions uh, that occur in China, changes in its market, can have wide-ranging effects. And, of course, uh, ripped straight from the, the headlines, uh, this year uh, is the recent uh, recycled fiber regulations, which have really uh, turned the markets upside down. And, and I'll turn it over to Xiao Min now to, to describe uh, uh, some background for that regulation. Okay. Uh, as you all know, due to the environmental concern, the government wants to control the unwanted low-end waste imports. So, uh, 
on uh, unsorted waste paper is included. Uh, Chinese government has said that uh, uh, this so this HS code is banned by end of 2017, and it means that no more imports in China by end, by beginning of 2018. And also the quality requirements has increased. And uh, uh, we think that uh, besides the environmental concern, there is another uh, hidden reason uh, is that why the uh, why the government released this ban. Uh, as we know that uh, currently the government actually wants to force some small inefficient mills out of the market to upgrading our pulp and paper industry and improve the profitability of the whole industry. So by ban the imports of the waste paper together uh, with uh, releasing another policy that uh, no longer uh, that the import permits of RCP uh, those who apply for it should have a production capacity over 300,000 tons per year and have related pulping and paper making machines. So this means traders and the small mills cannot get permit. So these small mills, normally they can import directly or they can buy from the traders. But now this, this way of imports has been stopped too. So those mills, small mills, uh, are normally uh, because they are normally the worst in pollution, so they don't have enough money to invest in the environmental country equip equipment. So that's why the government also wants them to phase out from the market. Yeah, thank you. And, and so we're going to start to uh, explore the impact of the regulation on pricing. And, and what's interesting is, is uh, this action by the government is really set up a natural experiment for hap what happens when markets uh, become externally influenced. So on the chart uh, you're seeing now we've got three price series. Uh, the two top uh, lines, the blue is American OCC, number 11 OCC. The middle line is recovered uh, waste paper, number three. Those both uh, reflect the left axis or refer to the, the left Y axis. And then the bottom is a local OCC price, a nine dragons price, which is on the second uh, dairy axis in RMB per metric ton. And what we can see from this chart is very clearly uh, the three lines you know, really participate in, in what you could argue is the same market, that prices move uh, together, they, they look highly correlated. Of course, there's some quality differences among the three grades, and so therefore you, you should have some differences in pricing, particularly with the blue line and the green line. But let's see what happens uh, as a result uh, of the ban. So as Xiao Min mentioned, uh, import permits uh, stopped. Uh, particularly hard hit are these small mills um, who uh, don't meet the threshold uh, to get any more paper. And then certainly uh, imports required. So it's almost, it's almost as if a dam, if you can imagine, was put in place at the border of China. And so what, what has happened is you know, downstream of the dam, the, the river uh, really goes to a trickle. So you have a little bit less volume. And then upstream, which we're seeing in uh, North America and Europe, uh, the water backs up. In this case, uh, the water is waste paper. And so if some of you have read news articles about uh, surpluses of OCC and falling prices in the U.S. And then that's, that's really why is because we've had this sort of artificial damming of recycled fiber trade. And so uh, once the ban's uh, put in place, we can see quite dramatically uh, something immediately has happened, which is that correlation that we saw previously between the three lines has now broken. Uh, most interestingly, the green line, again, which is the number three um, waste paper, has really flatlined. Um, and, and that's because there's no market for it anymore. Um, the, the market's gone away, at least now. And so for that reason, there's really nothing to bid on. Now, uh, something that, uh, Jiao Min, I'll ask you to speak a little bit more to is what's happened with the, with the purple line, which is the local OCC price, and really uh, driven up uh, dramatically by speculation. Uh, can you expand on that, please? Okay, uh, because um, uh, first thing is that the ban has been released, then people are not willing, all the traders, they uh, they want to wait for the policy to be more clear. Then they stopped code co codes for the uh, imported RCP. So that's why the imported, even the AOCC price has dropped, because the, the deals there are very little. And also, uh, so people, so as uh, alternative resources, 
local local OCC, the price has been hiked, and especially for recently, the, in China we have a very big online festival. And so lots of corrugators they want to wants to keep very high inventory uh, to prepare for this online festival. Actually, this festival the total revenue online sales over 40 billion US dollars. So it's a very huge thing. So these corrugators, they keep very high inventory, so which push high the demand of local OCC. And there are a lot of traders, they do speculations, and so the price hiked before this festival. And after that, because the corrugators, they have high inventory, not, still con not yet consumed, so the price dropped dramatically. And it's going to have uh, huge impacts on producers in China. So the chart that, that we're showing next is imports of recycled paper by grade in China. The chart on the left is container board producers, and the, the chart on the right is coated recycled box border CRB. Uh, some of you may, may be more familiar with um, and it's shaded, so the purple is unsorted waste paper, uh, and the orange is sorted. And you can see, although Container Board uses unsorted uh, waste paper, not nearly in quantities as CRB producers, which you can see on the right. And as the headline on the chart says, that these, these mills are now having to buy the, the very high-priced uh, sorted uh, RCP or the extremely high price local waste paper to run their mills and of course that's that you know that uh, really starts off this sort of speculative frenzy because the last last thing mills want to do is have to shut down for uh, lack of fiber and so it's going to put mills at risk again this is a viability chart this is for CRB producers in China you can see on the x-axis it's about a 14 million metric ton market Again, red's at risk, as we saw on the chart before. And the numbers here start to get staggering. Um, so, so the small mills, as, as Xiaomin mentioned, which may not you know, meet the threshold to be able to get waste paper, and those mills at risk account for 3 million tons of capacity in China. And those mills are at risk now of closing, which, which is probably part of the underlying reasoning for the regulation is to get some of these small mills out of the market. Now, of course, that has consequences of its own because as small mills come out of the market, you're left with the big giants. And, and so as we've seen in, in other parts of the world in this industry, consolidation, uh, really concentration of industry can have uh, dramatic impacts of its own in terms of market dynamics. Moreover, as waste paper prices have shot up, um, as furnish shoots up, it, it raises the cost of production of those grades. Uh, the purple bars here is, is again, CRB. And what we've shown this against is the orange bar, which is the production cost out of Fisher Solve of, of FBB. Uh, for those on the call who are not familiar, FBB stands for folding box board. Uh, it's, a, it's a great board that can also be used in these folding box board applications. And, and in some cases, there's there's segments of the market where you'd use, uh, you prefer CRB and others where you prefer FBB, but there's enough of the market uh, that substitute uh, between each other. You could see some interesting dynamics. And so as recycled furnish prices increase, as we've shown in this chart, um, you get to a point where FBB uh, becomes cost effective. And FBB uses some uh, virgin craft pulp in its, uh, in its furnish. And so if if uh, this kind of regulation was to become long-term and it caused uh, some switching out of CRB and FBB, you could see, you could imagine how that would increase uh, demand for FBB in China and possibly then virgin craft pulp. And so let's think about, we just showed implications within China in terms of uh, you know potential uh, uh, switching in mills within China, CRB versus FBB. Let's think about other parts of the world if this sort of what we've seen in terms of the speculative price boost uh, continues or there's a enough of a recycled shortage in China that we have a, a permanence in terms of uh, higher virgin demand well what are some implications uh, one could be that obviously non-integrated mills in the rest of the part of the world get pressured uh, in the case that they compete in markets with integrated mills for example some European coated free sheet and specialty mills are non-integrated uh, another example, same same kind of concept in North America. Uh, there's uh, in North American tissue. There's uh, many mills which are integrated into pulp, uh, like GP, Resolute, Clearwater, etc. 
Uh, and then there's lots of mills that are non-integrated to pulp have to buy market pulp. And so in these cases, we can see a, a permanent change in uh, market pulp prices, or at least even a short run change could change their competitiveness as well. Uh, we might even see changes in adjacent grades. So uh, uh, mar many market pulp uh, machines, particularly in the South U.S., uh, that make fluff also swing to Southern craft bleach pulp. And so to the extent that uh, swing capacity becomes more expensive, that raises the opportunity cost um, to to uh, to make fluff, which which can't which could provide um, some buoyancy in that market as well. And and uh, what frankly what it could also happen what it could also drive and we've heard some questions that we'll address at the end of the of the webinar is it's possibly an opportunity for imported uh, virgin grades in China so um, the concept here is why you know why dry uh, a fiber twice when you can just ship the paper directly into China and we'll explore that next so possible import opportunity so this chart is the viability of liner board producers in China. Again, there's a there's a large tranche of mills in, in the red section that um, are vulnerable to both higher recycled paper prices and also volatility in those prices. On the next chart, uh, we've got both high-end test liner or liner board, recycled liner board, and low-end test liner or recycled uh, liner board in the purple and the blue, and we've compared that to OCC prices. Um, uh, as we see most recently, there's been a jump in test liner prices, uh, partly driven by speculation. But what's interesting is, is we've now come to a point, I've, I've added on the shaded area, uh, the, the current or most recent imported craft liner price in China and RMB is, we're now at a point where test liner prices in China uh, are equivalent to imported KLB. So, so many out there would, would logically assume that this is a point where we start seeing some switching. However, the answer might not be so straightforward. Uh, and again, I'll turn it over, Xiaomin, if you want to describe uh, some we reasons from a local market view why why immediate switching to craft liner might might not be as widespread as some might think. Uh, okay, so currently the domestic Chinese corrugators, they use very little craft liner. And uh, there are a lot of non-price related barriers to, to quickly switch in. For example, like the FMCG customers here, they would require JIT service of these uh, boxes to be delivered. And uh, so compared with domestic supplier, the shipment cycle of craft liner board is much longer than local supply. So it means that uh, either the corrugators, they have to enlarge their inventories, which would add a lot of cost to their operations too, or either the traders, they have to enlarge their in inventory, the warehousing things. And second, the Chinese corrugators right now, they, they don't really want to uh, change easily because they are worrying that uh, their customers, if their customers get used to the higher quality craft liner board, and uh, if the price of local liner board goes down again, then it very it is very difficult for them to persuade the customer switching back. The the reason would be very lousy to them. Yeah, thank thank you. And and again this is short term. Now now it could be if there's some permanence um, in in the regulations that results in a, a fiber shortage or a sustained fiber shortage, of course you're still gonna make boxes in China. Uh, and that's still got a bit get fibered. And again back to the concept of leverage. China is so big now. Um, it has so much leverage that it, it's only a few percentage points, even if there's a few percentage points of increased use of KLP, of KLB, um, could have huge uh, consequences globally. So if, if uh, just to throw some numbers for people to do a thought experiment, if, if China's production or demand for a uh, container board today is right at, let's use 50 million tons for easy math, and and the result of this regulation was increased demand of KLB by even uh, 2%. That's uh, 100,000 tons. It's a, that's a significant chunk of the globally traded um, market. And actually, I did the math wrong. 2% would be 1 million tons, which is, which is 25% or, or so, or 20% of what's traded globally today. So small percentage points, uh, even if there's no changes or substitutions on mass, it doesn't have to be much um, to have a uh, very large impact uh, on the global uh, global market. 
And there's another possible opportunity for China's neighbors as a result of, of uh, the regulations. It could very well be, um, we're hearing some of this now, which uh, Xiao Min will expand on, but it could be opportunities uh, for countries close to China um, to export uh, test liner into China. Xiao Min, do you want to add some color to that? Okay, so uh, since since the, a lot of uh, Asian countries, they are like China, uh, which is short of uh, virgin fiber, like India, and uh, they are using a lot of imports uh, ICPs. So if China has a ban here, then there will be more available uh, unsorted ICP at cheaper cost. So these countries, so these countries like Vietnam, like Thailand, like India, maybe they will get a lot abundance of additional ICPs. Then, uh, for example, like Vietnam, because it's quite nearby to, to, to China, then the cost, it, it is possible that they can produce cheaper container board and send back to China. Actually, um, uh, for these days, I've heard that a lot of traders are uh, asking from Japan and from Thailand, from Vietnam, whether they can export a container board to China. So these, these countries, the neighbor countries, could actually benefit from the ban. Yeah, and continuing that theme of trade, what's interesting um, is despite all of the production, all the capacity in China, China's not really a major player in global pulp and paper trade. So this chart shows um, China's a percent of uh, global paper production. And you can see, although they, they import a tremendous amount of market uh, craft pulp, which is on the right, um, so far today, uh, there, there hasn't been a lot of trade in terms of percentages of, of what's traded globally. But that could change. Um, the government is actively trying to encourage more trade uh, out of China and into China. And so here's an example of, of one uh, policy by the government called the One Belt, One Road Initiative, which uh, many of you have probably read about. And, um, and this initiative is designed to really spur uh, exports out of China uh, to countries involved in the initiative. Uh, you can you can read the numbers, but they're quite large. Uh, almost a third of global GDP, uh, two thirds of global population, and a third of today's trade. Uh, and the and the the government is investing a uh, hundred plus billion dollars into this effort. And so uh, this this could drive more increased trade. And as we think about China in terms of all the capacity. Uh, that's been installed it could possibly uh, pose a threat for some of its neighbors or possibly an opportunity for some folks who have a comparative cost advantage to be able to ship into China. We're seeing some results of, of this activity already. So this is a, a chart from the National Information Center of China. Uh, we can see the red line, which is exports out of China, have grown. Uh, uh, the growth rate of exports has, has increased by about 20% percent over the last five years, so 23 to 28 percent, that's the top red line. Um, so there is, we are seeing some benefit. Uh, t today most of that benefit is, um, is, being, is being realized by equipment producers in, in China, but, uh, but certainly there's possibility this could also increase trade of paper. And we talked about this, uh, referred to this on, a, on previous slides, but you know, China has had this rapid growth of, of uh, pulp and paper capacity. And as we all know in this industry, uh, supply and demand runs in cycles. And so there are periods of overcapacity uh, and periods of tightness. And, and we, we uh, reference periods of overcapacity, which, which led to subdued OCC prices in a previous PIC article, which you can read. And so far, production has been focused on the local market. So Chinese firms, for the most part, haven't been um, haven't been focused on exporting paper. Uh, but as the government encourages companies to trade more, uh, we do think it is quite a possibility for those grades that to do that are cost competitive um, to be exported uh, in larger volumes out of China. So equipment, and, and, and what we just talked about paper is not the only thing that, that China is trying to export right now. Um, they're also trying to export capital. So uh, this chart shows the number of M&A deals executed by year. Um, we can see quite dramatic growth since 2013, uh, where there's been $235 billion uh, in deals done. Um, we can see it's on a, a, um, a steady up, 
uh, upwards growth trajectory, and, and, and we're going to see that continue. We're already feeling some of it in the pulp and paper industry. So the real blockbuster deal this past year was APP, uh, which is, a, is a, actually an Indonesian company, but has very huge presence in China, one of the largest Chinese um, in terms of um, share of China's production. That's a $5 billion deal, just under $5 billion. And then another uh, company, uh, Shanying Paper, just purchased a um, European specialty producer. And I guess, Zhao Min, I, to turn over to you again, I, we'd like to get a perspective of, you know, the mindset of some of these the, the companies that are operating in China, what, what's driving them to want to invest capital overseas in, in the okay. paper industry? Uh, because currently the Chinese domestic market is very crowded already due to the long-term extensive investment in capacity, as you know. And uh, now the producers, uh, actually they are rich now, so they are looking for overseas opportunities in global arena along the value chain to strengthen their competitive positions. For example, like APP, uh, just about, about the raw materials, the pulp mill. And for Shine, it expands into overseas specialty paper grade, uh, which this paper is potentially, we, they can import back to China. Since the specialty, pulp, well, specialty paper grade in China is the, the grade that uh, the overcapacity situation is not that serious here. So I think they just want to uh, strengthen their positions along the value chain or diversify it into another business. Thank you. And as you say, they've got, you know, it's a huge uh, industry now with lots of capital, uh, and we're certainly seeing that in some of these deal values. Okay, so let's, let's think about um, some consequences of China's growth on industry suppliers, so uh, equipment and uh, chemical and suppliers to the industry. Um, we just talked about Chinese Chinese uh, operating companies buying other pulp and paper companies. What about uh, Chinese equipment suppliers buying other equipment suppliers worldwide? So as we all know, China's already got a huge base of demand and factory capacity, and and it's been true for some companies that doing business in China has been hard. So IP exited the Sun JV, its stock price actually increased. Um, we talked about the humongous uh, tissue growth, very rapid tissue growth in China. What, well, what's striking, and uh, I want uh, some of you on the call to contemplate, is out of all the tissue machines that have been built over the last several years, only 30% were built by Western companies. The rest were built by Chinese-based companies. And so you could argue that there's uh, many Chinese companies that are getting lots of experience in developing uh, bases of skills and how to how to build and supply uh, paper making technology. And so far, what's interesting is Chinese equipment uh, suppliers have really focused in their own home market. So this, this chart shows percentage of all pulp and paper making equipment by country, uh, purple is of Chinese origin, uh, orange is other. Most, most of the time, that's the big uh, sort of Western companies that folks think about when they think about uh, industry suppliers. And you can see whereas China has a very, Chinese uh, equipment suppliers has a very large percentage of its home market, really don't see them much, uh, much anywhere else. Some in Indonesia, which is logical, it's close, and then a little bit in India, but really not much to speak of which is those of us who do any amount of consumer shopping is kind of odd if you really think about it. Um, we already buy lots of technologically advanced equipment um, from companies in China. So this chart shows imports by dollar value from China into the U.S. top 10. And, and, and is it really true that a laptop or PCs or electronics or smartphones with all of their inbuilt technology and quality tolerances is 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 less complicated than a refiner or a screen basket or paper machine clothing? Maybe. I mean, in some cases, it could be specialized. But you know, if, Ch if Chinese companies have figured out how to serve some of these uh, other tech markets in a large way, we can imagine it's not really a stretch to think that they could enter other um, equipment spaces uh, that we're more familiar with in the Chinese or in the pulp and paper market. And, and maybe that changes on the horizon. We talked about the one belt, one road policy, which is encouraging companies to export their goods. Uh, there's a huge um, base of mills in China that are already being supplied by local companies, and these companies are gaining expertise. They're gaining, they're, they're going through that learning cycle and learning curve where they've um, 
they're gaining expertise and, and, and becoming better. <clears throat> and so we're wondering if, if China goes from a land of, of opportunity, you know, the biggest market in the world that's growing, to possibly a large uh, land of threat. And if that's true, then you know uh, what could some companies do um, to to uh, to mitigate that? You know, possibly JV or specialize their products, um, other strategies. And there could be an opportunity for Western mills that are wishing to lower their capital costs. So, like uh, we we've, we've seen in other spaces, other industries, electronics, um, lots of goods are made in China because they're cheaper. They're cheaper to be made in China than they are in Western companies. Well, if that's true for, again, uh, PCs and televisions and smartphones, could it also be true for paper equipment? And if it performs just as well, why wouldn't mills buy that equipment um, from from companies that um, can can meet the performance requirements, which is big, obviously of huge importance um, at a competitive price? So one example um, that, that could be up, up for grabs in terms of this market opportunity is, is really the boiler conversion in China. Xiaomin spoke about the government's uh, desires earlier to uh, improve the environment in China. What you're seeing in, in this uh, sequence of maps is the, the number of boilers at pulp and paper mills by fuel source. Um, green is coal, uh, blue is gas, and it's pretty striking from this chart in terms of the difference we see in China's uh, boilers versus uh, more developed countries, much more uses of coal. And there's 400 coal boilers uh, operating in paper mills today in China, and they're going to get converted to gas. Many of them will. So uh, this chart shows that uh, the Chinese have just executed a very large deal, what some are calling the gas deal of the century, with uh, Russia's large gas producer Gazprom. It's a $400 billion deal, so almost half a trillion dollars, and, and that, that was passed in large part to drive an increased use of, of cleaner natural gas compared to coal. So these boilers are going to get changed out. We just talked about opportunities for uh, equipment suppliers or threats, and this possibly could be an opportunity for equipment suppliers. So if, if we imagine a boiler conversion is 10 million or 50 million, um, again, back to this concept of leverage, uh, 400 boilers uh, times 10 million is a is a is a huge opportunity for uh, suppliers who might participate in this activity, and there's going to be more of this kind of opportunity to come. Okay, so uh, we're we're going to uh, wrap things up now uh, for the webinar. Uh, and just really in, in in conclusion, what we want to cover, and I'll let you read the bullets, but. Obviously, uh, for one, we've only scratched the surface of everything that is China. It's the world's largest producing country, uh, world's largest market, and and can't possibly cover everything there is to cover in in 35 minutes or so. And and it's really only one of of the global kind of themes uh, that are influencing the pulp and paper industry. There, there, are, there are many that we can think of. We've talked about machine conversions before, which is an opportunity for folks in stressed segments. E-commerce um, is changing our daily lives. It's, it's to some extent changing parts of our industry as well. And that's um, occurring in huge ways now in North America and Europe and Asia. And, it, and as e-commerce changes our shopping habits, it also changes our packaging habits, uh, which can have wide-ranging impacts in in the industry. And as we've, we've kind of uh, examined within China, these, these, these trends, these large global trends, represent opportunities. In some cases, they, they might represent threats uh, to your business. And, and the way you decide which it is and, or how you, how you capitalize on the opportunity or how you mitigate the risk is through good analytics. And of course, that's what we do here at Fisher. Um, our mantra is, is that uh, you know, businesses to make the best decisions, the most profitable decisions, need good information, and, and that's what we do. And we do it by uh, providing our clients with uh, the best data in the industry, analytical tools for you to use it, and a, a very uh, high level of consulting support to help you navigate um, today's landscape, which is um, always changing. <laughs>